Let's have Hi, uh, uh, our our panelists. Hi, Pastor Manning. Hi, <laughs> Pastor Manning. This is Valerie. Valerie Jefferson. Uh, Pastor Manning, do you let everybody know that we respect everybody? Then everybody need to keep their um their mute on mute and wait to everyone to ask their questions at the end at your directions. And everybody, that's. Be safe, and we're glad to have you here because we want to get this information from our guest panelists. Thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you, Valerie. Appreciate that. Always love your energy. Appreciate you. All right, everybody. Um, and so um, I'm going to ask uh, first, uh, uh, Dr. Shawan, uh, uh, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us uh, uh, what you're working on and tell us why you um, are excited to be a, a, a part of this forum and why this issue is important uh, to, to you. All right, thank you, uh, Pastor Manning. And let me first correct the record to say, uh, I'm not a doctor, not oh. yet. <laughs> but uh, I do have that JD degree, you know. So uh, I am Shawan Bernard and I come to you all again in the role of uh, president of the Lower Ninth Ward Voters Coalition. And part of what I do, uh, what I seek to do is to make sure young people have the opportunity to register to vote, to be engaged and to uh, advocate for their issues. Um, the organization was started just a little bit about the Lower Ninth Ward Voters Coalition. We started about officially eight years ago and that was when I ran for a race for the school board. And the difference between uh, third place and first place was about 27 votes. And the people who I was working with, Walter Goodwin and uh, Calhoun, uh, Willie Calhoun, uh, were from the ninth ward. And they were sharing with me how they could get voters to turn out. And that was not necessarily the case because in the ninth ward, there was about maybe seven or eight percent of the people who participated in that particular election. Eight years later, uh, looking at the returns from Saturday, uh, not much has changed across the city. The challenge that we face is daunting. Uh, I know, I believe that the people who are on this call are more engaged than our typical person we seek to reach. So tonight I'm excited about at least sharing the reality of where we are, trying to uh, just get an understanding of how we can each make a difference and what that difference could be. So with that, I'll stop talking and I look forward to hearing from Paige and then engaging about where we are. All right. Thank you so much, my sister. Yeah. appreciate that. And we're um, want, want to just to hear more about where we are. Um, and so let me invite Paige. Uh, Paige, if you would just uh, give us uh, uh, an understanding of why this issue is so important to, to you and to our city and uh, why you're excited about this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Manning. I really appreciate being here with everybody. And um, I mean, this is this is an issue that I've worked on in my personal capacity and in my professional capacity for um, for most of my adult life. And Paige, let me um, say, Paige, Paige, mm -hmm. just a minute. I don't know if it's just me that's having trouble hearing you or is it? Oh, it, no. You sound a little bit low to me. Is let me it? See. Let, is me that check just... my, let me check my settings. Everybody else, are you good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe okay. I might have oh, went sure. off of. Okay. Well, okay. hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to. <laughs> hear me oh, okay. Keep going. Um, okay so I, one of the reasons I think I was asked to to come here today is um that well I'm very passionate about voter engagement and um I did a lot of my work in Georgia so I was part of I was one of the architects sort of of the the blue wave so to speak that um that came to Georgia and so um you know, had a long time working in Georgia, a state very similar to Louisiana in a number of ways, very different in a number of ways, very similar in a number of ways. Um, but, you know, come with, with, I hope to be a message of hope that like, we can figure this, this stuff out. Things were pretty dire when I was doing, when I started doing this work in Georgia, um, in one of the elections when, that I first worked in was like the low point. It was 2006. 
2006. So not one of the first ones I worked in, but like, I think it was 2006, but I'd have to go back and, and check. And the Democrat got the lowest performance, um, 36% statewide. It's the, the worst we'd ever seen, all this other kind of stuff. And from that point to, uh, to 2020, we saw a remarkable change in the electorate, in voting patterns, in um, and who is turning out. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation to talk about why I think a lot of that has happened and how we can take inspiration from that and talk about what we might could do here um, with the opportunities and challenges that that Louisiana faces. Um, and I'll also mention just very quickly in my per professional capacity, I work for a, a, a funder and we fund at the uh, crossroads of power building, civic engagement, um, vote election protection and protecting voting rights in BIPOC communities in 15 states and three regions across the country, in Louis including Louisiana. So we are investing heavily in this state and in the, um, the organizations that I hope will help be part of the solution as we work through this challenge to, to voter, voter turnout that we have here. So I'm, I'll stop there and then we'll get into the Thanks. conversation. Thank you, Paige. Thank you for that so much. Um, so I'm not one to, to just kind of sit and wallow in, in the problem, but I think we, we do need to have an open conversation about realistically where we're at right now. Um, uh, so, so we know that it was, it was uh, just say abysmal for the uh, gubernatorial uh, race as well as for this last race um the, the the on saturday as well as prior races uh to the uh, gubernatorial race where what what is the state of where we're at right now what, do we need numbers uh, whatever you want to uh, kind of your overall an analysis of that uh of where we are in terms of voter turnout um swan let's begin with you all right so i did an analysis the lower night ward voters coalition held a community meeting uh about a month ago. And I looked at the data from uh, October 14, 2023. And just looking at the total number of registered voters and the turnout. So that data statewide says we have 2,977,000 people. And 36% of those registered voters participated in electing the uh, current governor for, uh, I think that's where I pulled the numbers from in terms of how many were registered for the governor's race, the number of voters and a percentage. So statewide, uh, only 36% of registered voters voted. I uh, also looked at, uh, which means 1,892,000 didn't vote, you know? So that's the uh, 64%. And if you add up, I was just curious, if you add up the first vote and the second vote for the first place winner and the second place winner, the number of nine voters outnumbered, you know, the voters. So when we have, so the challenges or the concern is most of us are, or most people who are registered are not voting. So if we could get the registered voters to vote, you know, that that's, that's a challenge for us, number one just how do we uh, mobilize and how do we inspire those people to turn out and how are those connections made, I think, or a challenge for us. Sometimes when I hear people discuss and I go to uh, forums like this or with like-minded people, we tend to want to say that it's the politicians who are running for those offices who have to inspire the people to get to the poll. Well, that's if they really want them to be engaged, right? So how do you combat uh, getting people who don't recognize perhaps how they are affected by elections? In particular, we can think about an impact just recently when the current elected governor refused uh, food stamp subsidies. And, you know, and I say, you know, that's the direct impact of, a million, almost two million people not voting. And we're going to get laws that we may not necessarily agree with because our non-voters are not engaged. So I see that as, uh, even though we work directly with doing registration, 
I think the biggest impact could be on how we get non-engaged people to vote, just to get involved with that. I don't know if that's something Paige can yeah. add to, and then we can have a discussion about what some options are. Yeah, so I have a list of questions too, but we're, we're just kind of taking back and forth. Um, two, uh, nearly two million. That that is yeah. very, uh, very disappointing and and very upsetting. Uh, Paige, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure. Yeah, and and uh, and that yeah, that number uh, like the thirty six percent is is exactly right, and that means that about what eighteen percent of the people of Louis of the registered voters in Louisiana chose our our current leader, who actually cast a vote in favor. Of this leader, it's outrageous. Um, but I think there's a couple things to this point, and I think that uh, that Shawan touched on on a number of them. One of the things that um, we really have to look at when it comes to to voter engagement, especially among voters that um, that don't always come out. Like you said, this is a different group of people. We are the ones who are engaged. We'll vote, you know, for dog catcher on a rainy day, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people, you know, really won't. And so. Um, I think one of the things that that is really important is to, in my opinion, is is really understanding how the Democratic Party of Louisiana, in my opinion, has failed the voters of this state. And what I mean by that is um, they we voters often need to be given a reason to vote and even more than I think connecting the issues, which is important, but they need to have hope. They need to have hope that somehow their vote will make a difference. Right. And I feel that too often. Um, the way the party itself conducts its voter engagement programs, it's all very transactional. Oh, you're registered. Oh, you're a registered Democrat. Oh, you're a registered Black voter. We expect you to just turn out, right? Magically, we're just going to come and turn out. And it's not that simple, especially when there's no, like, money behind the campaign, when there's no real education happening. Um, and I'll also take a moment and, you know, these are larger problems than we in this group can fix, but I think under like talking about the problems can help us lead to solutions, right? These, this jungle primary, this, this nonpartisan open primary thing that we have is very, 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 it's, it's, it's working as designed, right? It to suppress the vote, to, to, to make people frustrated and stay home. And one of the things in my work in Georgia, um, I work a lot with like voter registration and, and, and voter turnout work. And when I was there and we did focus groups um, of, of non-voters or infrequent voters. And we had, you know, we we did a focus group of of black male non-voters, infrequent voters, what, black women, Latino men, Latino women, all the way across the board. You just get a, a sense of what was happening. And one of the the conversations that really stuck with me was that this these voters sort of had this conversation about how it's not that they don't want to vote it's that they're afraid of making the wrong decision right and so they want to make sure that they're educated enough about who these candidates are that they cast the vote for the right person because if they if they cast the vote for the wrong person that person gets in there and messes up it's like it's my fault i'm the one who voted for them and put them in there right and that has really like that has really stuck with me, and especially looking at the this this nonpartisan open primary where we have where we have all of these names, right? All these people. I I am a very educated voter. I only know like four of them, right? <laughs> you know. But if I'm not an educated voter, and I just walk in and I'm like, well, I think I've heard Landry's name, and I don't know Sean Wilson. That's a relatively common name. Is that the same Sean Wilson that I heard this about or whatever? And if they don't know. They're they're they they're just like I'm not going to do it. It's just too much, and I feel like it's not on them to figure all that out. It's on our institutions to help them figure out and to help them know how to do that. And so it's a it's a problem with a primary system or a, an election system that is not that easy to fix. But if we're aware of that's what's happening, then we can create programs and we can engage. Um, folks in in different ways that that get them the information that that they really need to turn out. Yeah, um, so. and, and I think you're exactly right. In, in our in our fast paced world, in um, in, you know where where people digest information in, in short chunks, have a low attention span. Uh, people are overwhelmed with information, and so when you go into the ballot box, somebody told me that the other day. They said, "I went in. There's 28 names. I don't know any of those names. I was just you know pressing names." Um, and so, but, but the question becomes, how do we 
what's the solution in getting that information out out to people in a way that they will uh, digest it, that will will take it in, will be able to process it? Is it? I don't want to see another mailer <laughs> in my mailbox. Right, I, don't, right. I don't care to ever see another one. So what is the solution to that? I, I would love to hear both Siobhan and you, Paige, to respond to that. Siobhan, you want to go first? Um, and I don't, so yeah. Uh, in listening to Paige and just listening and taking some notes, and it's always, at least in my opinion, with the Lower Nightmore Voters Coalition, we did a couple surveys. And because we work with young voters, we work with uh, Xavier University, and they asked a question about uh, why uh, a person should engage in the voting aspect and how do we connect with that person. And what I, I found was that, or what the data revealed was that if we could make a connection, like to connect to that person, the challenge with that is all of these different messages that are necessary, you know, when it comes to say the governor's race. So how do we make a message that connects to a person who has an issue of housing and to let them know the importance of how the governor's race will impact them or their issue may be women's issues. And how do we then make that message and who's making that message and who's responsible for that messaging to make sure that we can get others to see how they are connected to this system that we have called democracy and how elections are important. So the education of people is a responsibility. I, I heard Paige talk about the party's position, right? And the Lower Ninth Ward Voters Coalition, we're a nonpartisan organization but I am a part of another organization that's a democratic organization. And from that perspective, how can we get Democrats involved in the system and what's the messaging from that group of people? So I know the issue building and how we have particular issues that we're all involved with from environmental and we need them to push that agenda and from housing and we need them to push that agenda and from domestic violence and all of those subcategories, I think, is important for how we divide this big elephant with the hope that somebody will see themselves and say, oh, that's why I need to vote. And how mm -hmm. those messages delivered and what platform, because Reverend Manning says he's tired of getting mailers. So between the mailers and the emails and the Facebook uh, commercials that once they tap into what you like and you do that query and you keep getting those messages, I think it's all necessary, but I do think it needs to be um, correlated. And I think there mm -hmm. needs to be some effort in, in terms of how we divide this task, you know, like how do we come together as a party and how do we decide that that's the message that environmental positions are going to put out. I haven't heard that conversation, but I think in my thinking, it's a good approach to have in looking at your data mm -hmm. and figuring out where people are. Now, where do we get the money from to do it? Where do we get the, t the skill set from to craft these messages that can go down to the core of a voter? I think we need to begin to look at that. I don't have the resources. We don't have the resources to do it, but I think it's a good place to start. And hopefully we have some representatives here who are of party, like party and like-minded that can begin to uh, organize around that effort. That's my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. So we, so, so what we, what we have done uh, that has hurt ourselves is by being too uh, segmented and divided. And if we could just come together uh, and talk about how, uh, how each one can take a piece of this and, and get on the same page, uh, instead of one worrying about its own agenda, uh, let's realize it's all a part of a greater agenda and start getting in the same room to conquer this. I, I, I love that. And if the Democratic Party, I'll, I'll say the Democratic Party uh, can get uh, get the funding and 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 be the the, the group that uh, galvanizes everybody as well as it should be, uh, then then this maybe can be done. Paige, what do you have to say? 
Yeah, so so I'll start by saying, so um, the work I do for a living is all nonpartisan C3 work. The work I do in my personal time is all party, progressive, democratic party stuff. So if you want me to talk more in one area or the other, I'm happy to do that. So just like, let me know. Um, yeah, I, I think for the sake of, you know, for the sake of this meeting, we probably should talk more nonpartisan. Yeah. Sounds good to me. So, yeah. um, but Shawan, to your point, like my my boss and I actually talk about this issue. There's there's a, a lot of, um, com on the communications piece, I just want to talk about that for a sec. There's a lot of communications research. There's like hit strategies and these other folks who do amazing research around messaging and like tailoring messaging to what's working in Louisiana and all this other kind of stuff. The problem that I keep saying to her is like, it's not connected. The folks on the ground, the folks in the the, the lower ninth ward, you know, voter coalition don't know this, don't know how to access this. And these are the exact people who need it. So what we, my, myself and my organization and others are looking to do is, is to build those, those, those pieces of connective tissue, right? So that, because it shouldn't be on you or this organization, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel every two seconds to have a message that, that we all want to share, right? And so um, I really feel that like finding out and figuring out how to build those connections are really important. Um, I also think that like one of the things that I'm hoping to see sort of built here is a like a communications hub specifically for Louisiana, again, to provide y'all and, and those folks like access to, um, to polling data and to shared messaging and to, to research messaging. I think this is really, really important because the more we're all singing off the same like songbook, the, um, the, the more powerful we'll all be. Um, and so some of that is starting and, you know, and I will play whatever role I can in absolutely like making those connections. And Sean, if we want to talk afterwards about like some of that stuff, I'm happy to do it and anyone here as well. Um, but I think, and I think that that goes to like this whole thing about coordination, right? I am a hugely collaborative human being. I believe strongly in coordination. I believe very strongly that it wasn't one individual organization who got us into this mess. And it's not gonna be one individual organization that gets us out of this mess. And so the sooner we all put our egos aside and come to the table and like all work together and you know define our lanes, and all of that, like the better off we'll all be. And I think coming to like all this bombarding of, you know, being bombarded with information all the time and like trying to find the right messaging that's gonna break through is really um, goes back to this whole idea of like, who can I trust, right? Being trusted messengers in your community is such an important piece to all of this. And I feel that like, as our parties and our institutions sort of get worn down, one of the things that we are missing more and more is this sense of community and belonging in our own in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities, across neighborhoods, next next. And so we need to to get back to more of that. And we need to have organizations where, you know, if this organization comes to me, I trust them. And if they tell me what to do, that it's time for me to go vote or these issues are at stake, then I'm going to drop what I'm doing and I'm going to go vote because they told me this was important. Right. And so it's, that takes money. It takes time and it, you know, and it takes year round engagement and it takes getting away from this, uh, like this transactional 50% plus one that we need to win approach and really making democracy real for people in a system that is that that is designed to make make it frustrating for them right to put barriers in their way to make it seem like their vote doesn't matter and so we need to have these institutions where we become the trusted messengers where we convene po folks like this is this is a great thing expanding expanding out like all of these things where we come together and then we can go back to our neighborhoods and you know, and proselytize and like get more people involved and engaged and all of that. I really think that um, that that's important. I'll say one more thing, Reverend, and I'll turn it back over to you. Like one of the things that I've been hearing a lot, I just got back from Mississippi. And so the work in Mississippi and Louisiana, um, one of the things I hear a lot is like, we used to do this. We as a community used to do that. And we used to have these teams and we used to do this. And a lot of it is for one reason and another, all, many of them very good reasons, that's a lot of that has been sort of torn away at the edges. And I think it's time for us to make a concerted effort as a progressive community, as a community that really wants to see, you know, the dismantling of racism, uh, the dismantling of white supremacy and, and, and 
working towards progressive change that will actually make lives tangibly better for the people of Louisiana. I think we just need to, yeah, you know, we need to all come together and to figure out how we're going to do that, divide and conquer, you know, like yeah. come together and work in a unified way. So. Right. That's right. What one sound, one voice is what I like to say. And if we could just come to a consensus that every group has to start mentioning two things, um, our environment and the impact of climate change on our environment that has to be across the board and voting uh, because our, uh, our our democracy will begin to crumble even more if we don't just start uh, uh, asserting and saying this is important to us that we're going to just sound the alarm and beat the drum over and over and over and over and over again. But but surely there there may be some things that we can do um, that are just chomping away as Swan, like Swan said at that elephant one bite at a time and is possibly one of those things <clears throat> um, tackling things like uh, having valid IDs when, when we go and vote. Is this part of the reason why voters stay home? Is that is that an issue that we can tackle? Do you see that as part of the problem? Um, Paige, you go first. Can you repeat that real fast? Uh, I was answering the chat. Sorry. Valid IDs. Is that is is does that get it? Is, is that a barrier to people getting out to vote? Is that something that we hear uh, that you hear on the ground as to so, what? I would say that I don't know that I necessarily hear it on the ground, but any obstacle you put to voting is going to have an impact on voting, right? Especially for people who already distrust the system that doesn't work for them, right? You make it harder. It's like, what, I, I have to go pick up my kids from school and I have to go shop and I have to do these things. And I and, and now they want me to remember to bring my ID. And it's just, and all of a sudden, why are you asking me for my ID? I feel that like, yeah, it is um, a barrier and it's particularly a barrier to those who already feel alienated from the system. The very people we want and need to engage to help us to help us change all these these things like um you know conservative conservative white voters already know how the system works and knows that it works for them so it's not going to impede their their ability to or willingness to vote but it will impede black voters willingness to vote latinx voters willingness to vote other things any obstacle that you put in place will have a negative impact on um on voter engagement do i think it's the biggest barrier no and I think it's a it's, it's a barrier and it's something that we need to work to address and the education around it and and everything else is all like packed into that and making sure people know what they need to bring with them to the polls and and all of that, which adds to the work that we have to do to educate voters. Shawan, you want to jump in there? Uh, just uh, to share that I don't think the uh, valid IDs is a is a challenge in terms of people saying that's the reason why they're not voting. I will also add that if you raise that issue with uh, elected officials, you may hear that in Louisiana, we provide free IDs for voting. And I will tell you that they do. The challenge with a free ID for voting is that the same criteria that you need to get a regular ID with your driver's, with your driver's license or your birth certificate, your social security card or proof of residence, it's the same thing you would need to get a regular ID. And this free ID that's available for voting is only available to people who have never gotten an ID through the state of Louisiana. So I, um, I attempted to try the process out to see how it would work. I went to um, veterans and just discussed with the people at the counter and they could not tell me of an instance where a voter ID had been issued. Like they didn't know what I was speaking of and mm. no one ever comes in to request the voter ID. So while the uh, provision is available that an ID would not be an obstacle in order to uh, vote, it's nothing that uh, is practical in terms of getting these free IDs for people uh, to vote. And again, I don't think I would challenge is Perhaps the ID is getting voters to the poll because they can ask to answer those three questions that talks about your mother's last name, your last four numbers of your social security, or your mother's maiden name and your place of birth that you could still vote. You know, we still have 60 something percent of the population who's not even trying that. So I don't think the reason they're not going to the poll is because of an ID. 
it's, it's mm. bigger than that. I, I want to be clear, because I, 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 I was ignorant as to that fact. So if you go to the polls and you give those three pieces of information, you can still vote without an ID? You're going to have a provisional ballot that they're going to have to uh, verify that your signature match once they get it back to uh, the Register of Voters Office and to match your signature. But you could still vote. They're not going to uh, include your vote at that moment in the count. It's a second step that has to be done. But you need that to know your mother's maiden name. You need to know your uh, your place of birth and your last four numbers on your Social Security uh, card which is why that's important on the registration information that that information is accurate. Because that's yeah. what happens for people who don't have their IDs. Like you could still vote, but your vote is not going to be counted in that moment. All right. Thank you for that. I did not know that. I wonder how many other people didn't. Paige, were you going to say though? I was, I was just going to follow up to say, but also when you're, when you're voting for no reason for no ID, you do have to validate. So there's another step that you have to do afterwards to make sure that your vote counts. Like if you're, if like, if they have a signature on file for you, that may be sufficient. I'd actually need to check on that. But if you just don't have an ID, so they don't have a signature on file for you, um, in Georgia, you have three days to go down and show your ID or they'll they'll throw your vote away. So it's one of those things that, again, that's another barrier, another way they they keep people, especially who thought they voted from actually having their votes count. OK, thank you. Let, let me just go back for a minute. Those two I'm just taking that I think it was one million eight hundred and ninety two or something people that didn't vote in the gubernatorial uh, election. When we, if if there is, does let me ask, it does. Do you know of an analysis that exists that says what was the main demographic, uh, or or the, the the percentages of people um, representing different demographics that didn't vote? What who who were these people mainly uh, that represented that that almost two million? Are these seniors? Are these folks between the ages of eighteen and twenty three? Uh, are they between 40 and 50? Do we have that sort of analysis so that we can begin to, do we need to, certainly we need to target everybody. Do we need to target that specific group first to say, why aren't you voting and how do we get you to vote again? Is that type of analysis there? It So the data is probably available through the state system that it could be requested and someone can do that analysis. I did look at, um, I took the total vote and it comes in terms of male, female. You can also do the age uh, demographic. It's probably something that pages groups or one of them, if they're doing some data analysis could, could do. We don't get that analysis by the state. We just get, if we pay for it. And when we go back, when the Lower Ninth Ward Voters Coalition goes back to look at data, we have to pay for the data. We don't have access to it. So typically when I go back to get data, I'm looking at, uh, for reporting purposes, the number of voters uh, that we registered for um, through the high school voter registration aspect. So, because that's all we can afford to purchase. Now, whether or not that data is available, that's one of the hindrance. I would love access to that. I'm a former math teacher. So I like playing around with numbers. So this is what I do in my free time, but I don't have, the uh, access to the data. And I'm not quite sure who the gatekeepers are of that data so that we could share it with groups like this to say, let's look to see who these people are, where are they living? How do you focus down or narrow down to that voter to then try and make that connection that when we're walking the block, that we know more than just you didn't vote last time, but that you're a subgroup of people who didn't vote, you know, can we canvas, somebody put in the comment canvas and we canvas too, but can we canvas based upon turnout in terms of looking at black men or, or black women or, you know, or people who are, have some connection to environmental law, right? Or environmental uh, issues. Like how can we get that data to really focus and to then inspire that person to say, hey, we know what you're concerned about based upon your social media uh, inquiries, and we see that you didn't vote. Here's some information that make you that may make you more uh, aware of how that uh, the upcoming voting election cycle will have an impact on your interest. 
I don't know where that data is. Yeah. I don't know who's the safekeeper of that data, but that's what we need that other people seem to have uh, privy to that we on the ground don't have. Thank you, Shawan. Yeah. Uh, Paige, what do you think? Yeah, and I mean, and this goes, I think, to this this whole idea of like connecting the dots and making sure that we're building a broader and a stronger coalition. Um, I mean, A, I, I don't have that analysis at my fingertips, but I'm sure I have it on my computer somewhere and I'm happy to like find it and share it out. Um, I can email it to Liz. Um, I'll also say that that a lot of the Schwann, what you're talking about, um, can be found in the voter file, like who voted, who didn't vote, their demographics, all that kind of stuff. And that's usually found in like in the voter file. And there are different voter files. There's Target Smart, there's Catalyst, there's um, there's NGP Van. But basically, these are all voter files that that tell us who's voting, who's not, and then also tells us like who's an environmental voter, who's a pro-choice voter. These are imperfect models, but they give us a sense um, of where people are. And and we there's also like you know a, a, a model for like how progressive someone should be, and so or someone likely is right. And so it helps to make these. Um, your, your voter engagement program stronger because you're talking to the people you want to be talking to. And when I was running pro Georgia in Georgia and we, we pulled, um, we had about 30 partners that came together that, that worked together to do voter engagement, voter registration, all that. Um, and uh, one of my partners said, you know, the most inspiring thing is we're not shooting in the dark anymore. We're talking to the voters. We know we need to be talking to, and we know that the, we're having a much greater impact, a much better use of all of our times <laughs> than, um, than when you're just trying to do it kind of blind. So um, one of the things that, that I'll again, try to see how I can figure out is, is increasing folks access to the voter file, to that information. Um, it, there often is a fee, but there are also ways to get it without one. The, and again, I think if we're really gonna build a movement, we all need to have access to these kinds of tools. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and 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 I hope we're we're all keeping good notes here, especially our folks from Justice and Beyond, that we need to do something about making sure we all have access. Now, we all know that there is a um, presidential election coming up. It, we, we there needs to be a full court press in terms of getting voter turnout raised. Um, it, it, as you look at this, both Shawan and 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 Pay, are 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 we? pressing forward like we're at a critical state uh, that we really are in, in terms of increasing voter turnout by November of, of this year. Uh, are we doing enough right now? And if not, what really needs to be happening so that we don't come back after the election and say, wow, that was just terrible uh, in terms of the turnout? Um, Pace, you, you answer first. Um, <laughs> I... <laughs> Uh, no. Um, I mean, we have some groups and I'm looking at the chat and someone asked, so do we have groups working together, um, on voting issue on voting issues and, um, you know, and would let, want to know the groups who do work on that kind of stuff. So we do have like coalitions. We have like the power coalition where there's vote and step up Louisiana and other folks who come together and coordinate their plans. Um, but I feel that there's more that we need. And again, I will give, for informational purposes only, I'll look to the parties to put the party to say, what are they doing to engage voters? What are they doing to um, to make this this relevant? And I think in, a, in an in an election like this one coming up, the presidential election, there's a lot of voter frustration. I don't know that um, anybody's super enthusiastic about what the top of the ticket is going to look like, and we need to figure out ways to, and we collectively need to figure out ways to spark some hope and some interest. Like the biggest thing you can give to any voter to, to make them turn out to vote is the idea of hope, right? That hope that things will get better, hope that what they want to see happens, um, you know? And so, and again, keeping this more C3, I think we need to really be doing a lot of like relational work with among our own like family and friends groups talking about this election, like really, getting people to get excited about something that feels a little slow to me, it feels a little sloggy right now, <laughs> um, you know, and really kind of like drum it up. So like we, it's like the concentric circles, right. It was, and it's almost like, like Obama's little snowflakes kind of thing. Like 
I can reach this many people who can reach this many people who can reach this many people who can reach this many people. And if we're anchored in communities like this and the one that you run, Shawan, and others, where we can just continue to, you know, reinforce this and make this a part of the conversation, even when it's not, and really inspire people to want to get out and think about how, like, what is exciting in this moment. Um, I think that's what we need to do because I don't know the groups that do this work all the time, Power Coalition Vote, Step Up Louisiana, Power and others are going to do this work and we can help them expand their reach and we can do, um, but we can also work within our own communities, right? And really reach out to folks who don't necessarily maybe care right now. Um, but, you know, we're like, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. If, I don't know what we can do this year, but I'm willing to try. All, all right. Shawan, what do you say? So looking or focusing on the young people, I'll just share just a little bit more data. Uh, I looked at the age range that the state uses in terms of identifying percentages of voters. So they broke the, and these are registered voters. So between the ages of 18 to 34, uh, that's about 25% of the population uh, with registration. And 34 to 44, it's about 21%. 44 to 54 is about 15%. 15% 15 for 55 to 64-year-olds and about 23% or of our registered voters are 65 and older. So we have more people on the younger uh in a younger age group coming into voting now. And if we try and focus on, you know, who to target just based upon the demographics, you know, we would say target young and old, right? It's kind of like a, a bell shape, well, an inverted bell. But there are a lot of young people. Um, some of the efforts of some of the groups, and I'll just, uh, without trying to or wanting to leave out anybody, the efforts with the Lower Ninth Ward Voters Coalition, the high school effort, is we work with the uh, some of the social organizations. In particular, we work with the Lengths Organization, uh, where they have schools throughout the city and they conduct the voter registration drives at those schools. Uh, the fraternities and the sororities divide their schools between high schools and colleges. Some of those uh, organizations are responsible for college efforts and some of them are responsible for high school efforts. So we're hoping that um, before the school year ends that we are going to connect with those organizations to make sure that each one has developed a plan for how they're going to work with the universities and also continue to support the school efforts of registration and uh, voter engagement. Our challenge continues to be having personal relationships with uh, people who are responsible for conducting these voter registration efforts and also encouraging or allowing students to participate during school time and hopefully realizing that it's value that you add to children and young adults when you allow them to participate in civic engagement, such as voter registration and attending forums and also going to early vote. We offer opportunities for uh, busing where the schools can uh, take the students to early vote. We wanna make sure that we work on increasing that. So if any of you are connected to schools and school leaders, making sure that they are scheduling those things for those uh, students, those opportunities. So working with the colleges, working with the social justice and uh, organization, we also, Black Voter Matters uh, have been in the state. So we work with that organization too. That's where we get most of our funding from to do these uh, types of nonpartisan uh, events. And um, we, we, I'm connected or we are quite familiar with Step Up Power Coalition and both. Again, it's bringing all of those organizations in a room where we could come up with a master plan about how we're going to collectively divide this work and what the important work is, I think we someone needs to uh, organize uh, 
that uh, realize that that organization needs to happen, especially for the fall election. So we're talking like a full voter registration or voter awareness for the education summit, so to speak, to get all of these key players on the same page uh, to begin this 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 full court press um, to 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 raise the voter turnout, um, and that 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 group needs to be convened last week. Um, is that is that kind of where we're we're landing? I would I would say that that's a good starting point. This is a good starting place, and I think that's perhaps a next step that needs to happen. Paige, what do you think? I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, there there's coordination happening. There obviously needs to be more coordination happening. So let's do it. Let's pull everybody together. Let's create a plan. Let's figure out what we're going to do. Let's give people access to the tools that they need and, you know, and get to work. Right. Like yeah. we know we need, you know, we know yeah. what we need to do. Now we just need the ability to do it. Right. And the path to do it. I'm here for it. And, and all those people, when you say, you know, when we talk about different groups of people, we need clergy who have a huge, as I like to say sometimes, uh, captured audience on, on several different days of the week, whether it's Bible study or whether it's worship. Um, the, we need to be saying that message from the pulpit or from you know whatever platform that you have, and they need to be in that room. Clergy need to be in that room. Yeah. Uh, principals and teachers need to be in that room. Uh, politicians and, 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 and leaders all need to be in that, in that same space together. Uh, getting the same uh, 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 words together, same talking points to begin saying over and over again. Um, I, I think that's part of where where we need to go from here as a kind of a one to three year goal, uh, really. Yeah. I don't know if I would add the politicians in the next step. Mm. I'm, you know. Because it's 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 we want everybody, and, and not necessarily just because we like your politics, you know, at this right. at this moment. So yeah. eventually, we bring them in. Yeah, you know, they have some group they're working with, but we got to get ourselves together and yeah. uh, have that opportunity to figure out what we could do to help support, uh, you know, in our partisan roles. You know, certain politicians. You know, like they're where's the I don't say the machine, like, but you know, we're we're fragmented. Like, how do we come together and um, figure out where we're going? Absolutely. And who's on board to to help us get there? Yeah. Okay. Pastor we're Manning. Gonna, yes. We're, we're gonna Brooke. We're gonna turn the questions in just a moment, but I want to. Oh, okay. Well, not, before we do that, I have somebody special on on our view tonight, and that is Ellen from Vela. And she might be willing to speak about getting the Vietnamese vote out. Yeah, uh, Ellen, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Ellen, you wanna? We'd love to hear if you, if you're willing uh, to tell us about what what we know that um, our Vietnamese population has had a great success in voter turnout. We'd love to 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 learn from you and and hear more about what you all are doing. In Vela. Hi. Um, hey. Hi. I'm so sorry. I was. I've been driving during this call, so I didn't expect to jump in with anything. Um, but I really appreciate listening to y'all today, and thanks for having me here and and call, calling on me. <laughs> um, I'll just be quick and and say that a lot of what uh, what. Um, y'all have been talking about today has really resonated with the same kind of issues that we've been thinking about and working on and facing. Um, and, you know, I've made note of a lot of a, a lot of the good ideas y'all have brought up as well. I think this year, as y'all have said, there is a lot of voter fatigue in general, to say the least, um, not to mention all of the barriers that exist and continue to exist. Um, the Vietnamese community here, yes, is a strong voting population, but a lot of the politicians and candidates, whether local or national, statewide, whatever it is, tend to ignore this voter base in general, and we don't get a lot of outreach. Um, and that's certainly 
not to not to mention we don't get a lot of Vietnamese language outreach, right? And Vela now has expanded to a larger API population in general. So that of course brings about a lot of different cultural issues and language barriers. Um, so we're working on different ways where we can tap into all of the various a Asian American communities here and how to strengthen that voter base as a whole. Um, in general, it's a lot of it's just a lot, a lot of relation relationship building, like like y'all have said. Um, and I I know that's a vague overall picture of of you know all of the nitty gritty. Um, but I would love to stay connected with everyone here too, and and hopefully I can catch some of these calls each week and be a little bit more not driving. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm gonna pass it back to y'all. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. We're so glad that you could uh, come tonight and that you're willing to, to speak on, on that a little bit. And definitely as we convene all groups uh, to talk about, you know, even even language barriers, um, that that should not be a barrier for anybody. And, and no one should be overlooked uh, within our communities and, and, and it is as part of this democracy. Uh, so thank you for saying that and making us uh, uh, just hear that tonight. Um, let's go to the, uh, the, the rest of the participants on the call tonight, uh, who have questions, uh, and if, or, and, or comments, uh, to make, especially directed to our panelists, if you want to maybe even directed towards Ellen, uh, and, and, uh, I'd be happy, Ellen, if you could stay and for some questions too. Um, but, uh, let's take questions at this time. I don't know who on my justice and beyond side is handling those, uh, Liz, is it you? Or are you taking questions? Yes. Hello, everybody. This is Valerie again. I'm going to ask uh, Brooke, will you help me out? But uh, I see, I do see uh, we do have a couple of questions and everybody's question is important, of course. And I am working. I am working. So I just went out. I just went out. Okay. Uh, we do. Oh. Uh, Hey Brooke. Sorry, I'm sorry. Can you start it out, well, Brooke? I have a question. Are you are you signed in as Josie Stalin? I don't see you on my on my. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay. If, okay. Yes, I am, darling Lane. I did send that text out. Thank you for that, Lane. But nevertheless, Brooke, can you start it out for me, please? Is there a question from our guest uh, from from anyone participating tonight? Yeah. Uh, yeah. These are okay, we have a question from Miss Nancy. Wait, oh, I was about to say they have questions in the chat too. And also yeah. Sur Surayu, uh, Miss uh, Nancy and Miss Darlene oh. next. Nancy, you first. And Darlene left. Oh, uh, okay. Miss Nancy question was um is is uh she was asking for uh Miss uh Bernard. She was asking about the language other than English of her information that she uh, was uh, passing out tonight of oration. So Nancy, look like she's gone. I don't know where she went. Oh, no, Nancy, I I'm, see you. I'm here. I'm here. So what, the, so what language are you seeking to get information in? Well, uh, Spanish. Um, I'm in the lower ninth ward and you know, there is a very growing, you know, Latinx population here. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering about, you know, what uh, the language access is for, you know, people moving into, you know, different communities. Um, but the Latinx population is growing in New Orleans. I find that there is a, a lack of signage. And I, I'm just noticing for our community because, you know, that's who I belong to. Um, you know, but it's probably the same, you know, for other groups that are, are, whose numbers are increasing, who are, you know, either present, presently, um, able to vote or potential voters. So I think it's important to have information about, um, events, right? If you're, you're doing voter education, if you're talking about places that people can, you know, cast a vote, you know, to have enough signage 
libraries are, you know, one um, place that people go because a lot of people attend with uh, children, but also at schools, right? Um, where your child goes to school was probably, you know, and churches, as the Reverend mentioned. But I think um, for our families, those are effective places. Also um, businesses, right, that we frequent. So, um, yeah, so I'm just wondering, you know, what, what is presently in place and maybe what can be upped, right, in this game. So presently, Thank you. when, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to try and expand to make sure we're inclusive with uh, more people. And when we pass out, it's typically English. And if we were to go to another community, we would have to request to make sure that we have that. So I'll make a concerted effort to make sure that when we request our uh, flyers that we pass out in the signage, that we also get it in, uh, in Spanish. Thank now, you, I may, Ms. Juan. I may have to call up on you to, to have you to edit it, you know, <laughs> uh, make sure it's proper. But Okay. Um, I can, I can, I can get you my info. Um, I travel a lot, um, you know, for work and family, but you know, I'm, I translation is something we can do, you know, from anywhere. I also wanted mm -hmm. to mention that I've been in touch with um, council member Thomas's office about this issue um, from last year, you know, and this is across uh, the board, right. In transportation, in um you know in uh broadcasting events right that are either hosted by the latinx community or that can include us um because that's a way to get all sorts of information out you know and um he in you know he told me that on his staff and, and district e is an enormous district there is no one really available to do translation he referred me to someone that works with his office in uh, City Hall, but imagine, you know, folks who work at City Hall or connected to the mayor, I mean, are wearing lots of different hats, you know, also. And if there okay. is one person, if this is one person that they directed me to, uh, you know, she's yeah. willing to speak about it, but yeah, I'm sorry. Didn't want to know that. But you, you, um, make such, you make such a good point that these are things that we have to demand uh, mm -hmm. that 2024, it is still uh, just nearly impossible. You have to go through such exhaustive uh, uh, means to try to get mm -hmm. a, a a translator. It's just inexcusable, um, and cool. and our city should be beyond that. We well, in right. a lot of we should be beyond that. Uh, but <laughs> but these are things that we need to demand. Um, we need to re, uh, get rid of the barriers for for every population. So uh, thank you for those comments. Um, we, so, if there's, uh, we need to do to move the needle on that. We need, so uh, the next the next thing is um, that Betty put in the chat that she wanted, she was curious about why the Democratic elected officials okay. were so in favor of the jungle primary. After Betty, we have Darlene. And then we also have two people who have their hands up in the uh, in the upper corner. Yeah. So we should probably. And Darlene, no, has, Darlene left. has left. She she yeah. put no, Darlene, Darlene has left. I'm still going to leave a question. Okay. Darlene, but, oh, Darlene. thank you for that. Way too many people talking at once. We have uh so so let's let's kind of tap down on that. Let me oh. ask this question though. The jungle uh, pages one. Define jungle primary for us in a way that everybody can understand. I think jungle we... jungle primary means that it is a nonpartisan open primary, which means all candidates run against each other regardless of party. In other states, how it tends to happen is either there are closed primaries, right? Like we all register by party here, right? So in other states where you register by party, the Democrats will have a closed primary so only people who are registered as democrats can can vote for candidates and so people um so as the idea is that the party then chooses its nominee right without interference from from folks who are not ideologically aligned with them um in some states like georgia we don't actually register by party so when people used to say to me all the time i'm a registered democrat i'm like eh, you're not really because we don't register by party you're registered and you're a democrat but you're not a registered democrat um, and what that how that worked was anytime I walked into an election on the primary election day, I could choose a Republican ballot or a Democratic ballot, but I had to choose, and this is primary only, had to choose the uh, 
the candidates running for that particular party. So those are two ways that it happens in other places. Here in Louisiana, it's everybody runs against each other all the time. Now, um, cut me off if I'm if I if I go too far off on this, but one of the reasons why I, I think this is not a good idea and why I think Democrats, the Democratic elected officials foolishly think that it is, A, I think they think it is because it's a system that they know, right? And it's a system that elected them. And so they tend to to want to like dance with the ones who brung them, right? Like like they're like this is how they got into office and I think they're afraid of changing it. Um the 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 downside is besides the fact that there's too many people, in my opinion, for voters, is that like we don't even qualify for that nonpartisan open primary until like August. So there's a lot of time for all of these voices, right? And then we have this nonpartisan open primary in like October. And then like three or four weeks later, we have the general, if we have a general at all, we call it a runoff. It's not actually a runoff. It's the general election, but we don't always hold it if somebody gets over 50% of 38% that was cast in the primary and gets elected like Landry just did, right? Is that like, and I know I walked through that fast, but like basically, so one of the things where I don't think we serve voters well is we have this really loud primary where all these people are running against each other. And then we don't have time when it's down to two candidates for those two candidates to debate on the issues and for people to say, wait a minute, oh my God, Medicaid is, Medicare is, I'm sorry, Medicaid is actually at stake in this election. Oh gosh, that's right. Those are the folks who want to take my right to choose away. Like all these sorts of things. We don't have time for that to really like coalesce around two options in okay. a general election like other states have. So Thank you, Paige. I, I do know there was a question that Betty had. I don't know if that uh, uh, answered Betty's question directly. Uh, Betty, you want to ask what you had? No, I think she pretty much pretty much answered it. I mean, I'm by saying that that's what they're used to, because um, I, I ask a couple of elected officials, and they're like, "You think it's bad now? What if we did it the other way?" And mm. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, it can't be any worse." <laughs> so, <laughs> I and I honestly think it can't be any worse. But like the 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 reason that Landry wants it is he thinks he'll get more like ridiculously conservative people coming out of his primary and then we'll yeah. win. So, yeah. but like for us, I think it's, it's, it doesn't actually favor us. And I think we have as many, as much chance in a two person election as we do. And I agree. People who, who care about that question. And uh, who is next Valerie? Okay. The next one is with Dolly and she's not here, but I was going to pick it back off of her question. Her question was, she don't know why, the files cost cost hundreds of dollars. But my question uh, to her question is, um, why come the executive Democrat Party or our city council or our local officials, uh, senators, even as our senators of Congress, cannot receive that list? The and list. we request it from them. Can okay. someone answer that question, please? So the why list is recorders, uh, okay. Okay, so the, we're talking about the voter list. So why it yes. costs hundreds of dollars is because these tools are very, very, very expensive. They're just very expensive. So what it is, it's like the voter file, like who's actually registered to vote, and then it has all of these overlays on it, like when they voted and all this other kind of stuff, but then also these these models and everything else. And it's a very expensive tool. Um, and so that's why it costs hundreds of dollars. The thing of it is, though, all elected officials in the state of Louisiana have access to it. They should have access to it through the Democratic Party. So yeah. that's weird to me. I'm not sure where that that where that confusion is coming from because they should absolutely have access because that's how they should be pulling their their lists to communicate with their own voters in their own districts. So that's an oh, interesting yeah. interesting yeah. thing. They, they may I, have I access, that. but they don't share it with others outside oh. of their they're, and they're not allowed, right? They're not allowed. They have to sign a contract. Both parties do this. They have to sign a contract with the party that says that they won't share the information. And it's all gatekeeping. It's all like, this is my preparatory stuff. But there are ways to access this information outside of that. And like I said, I'm gonna get I'm gonna pull together some some resources and figure out like the 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 least expensive ways that we can we can hopefully free ways that we can share that that kind of information. Yeah, that'd be very helpful. 
Thank you. Next, we have, I, I, I know that we still have hands. Hey, hold on, up. and I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. Shawan, if you want to say anything, please, like, I don't want to dominate this conversation. Go ahead, Shawan. You're, you're, you're okay. <laughs> Next, we have Nancy. She just spoke. Okay. Next, we have, thank you, uh, Brooke. Next, we have Elaine. Elaine? No. Wait, they have to come up for you. You're on mute. Yeah, Lane's talking. I just want to acknowledge that Sayero has had his hand up before mine. Okay. Well, uh, Sir Sierra. Oh, which means freedom. Uh, <laughs> oh, I have a solution. Uh, it was tried in both St. Louis and in Michigan. The non-committed voter. Uh, what I mean by that, we've had politician after politician since 1965, when we were allowed to vote, give us empty promise after empty promise, uh, and never be held accountable. We make this the people's vote. We take the directives in. That's what we don't do. We don't take our demands in. But we do beg, in the case of, as I was here a few years ago with you all, uh, the end of carcinogens in the community. Have they taken those carcinogens out of the community? No. Uh, we beg for better education. Are we being educated better? Are our children being educated better? No. We beg for a better judiciary treatment. Do we get better judiciary treatment? No. Now I'm saying this uh, because we have no agency. People are disgusted with voting because it's always led to nowhere. Unless we begin to access what we need and make demands to these individual politicians that, you know, we can even recall you if you don't do what we want. We're the people. You're an agency of government that goes by a script, and I heard this in the meeting tonight, that generally has no positive outcome for the masses of people. And I'm almost 70 and I'm damn near dead. So we've seen this all of our lives. And my opinion is, well, our opinion, it's a lot, quite a few of us now, that unless we take the reins of government, which is supposed to be for of and by the people, that's why we don't even see a damn democracy. We don't see it. <clears throat> and everything's outrageous. We're being terrorized every day by police. We're being incarcerated at higher rates just for blowing your nose. You got to, now they're rusting us down in schools to cut our hair. These types of demeaning, debasing uh, issues uh, that go on with us every day. We watch them as they take our children and kidnap our babies, the, D the CPS. We've seen all of this. Now as a collective, we're saying we need to make the demands. And people are more get, getting more on board. I heard you talk with young people. Young people have a totally different mindset than we did. We do need to give our young people more of a chance, an opportunity. But I see this in voting and stating that we have no confidence, which is why we don't vote in the institutions that set before us, both Republican or Democrat. Because Can it's you wrap it up? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it. You want me to wrap it for you? Rapidly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the fact of the matter is we definitely need to uh, change our mode of operation because going by the system as it is has proven that we're still in the same colonial mode of production. Thank you so much. Thank you. Valerie, the next question. Now we have Lane. Um, I just, um, it, this has been responded to in the chat by, um, um, I think by Paige, but my, my question was, I, I do understand that there was quite a victory in Shreveport in the last election. Um, uh, that's how we got a Democratic uh, sheriff in that runoff in Shreveport, isn't that right? Um, and I believe the first black sheriff too, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and not favored to win, but it came down to, I think it was either a, a, a difference, you want to talk about why, why your vote matters, 
I think it was a difference of, was it either a tie or there was one vote difference and so there had to be a runoff? That's right. This is the second or third time they've, they've had to vote on this because it is it was so close before. And yeah. that drew, my understanding is that that drew a lot of attention to that to that issue and to, to the, you know, well, who are these people and who, oh, why should I care? So I'm sure that was one thing that helped, but I just wanted to hear from, and Shawan, you may have looked into this because it was such a, you know, it was such a, an ex, a exceptional um, increase in voter turnout. Paige, you may have looked into this. So maybe um, if, if each of you could describe what was it? How did they, how did they do anything more than just the fact that, they, that they, the race itself drew attention to itself, but did they do more than that to get, um, to get votes, voters out and to get young voters out? Uh, I think you mentioned the group or Laura Lavati mentioned that the group is all streets, all people in Shreveport. And by the way, folks, she put um, their website or else Paige put their website and some information about them so that you can find out more about them um, in the chat. So don't forget to save your chat. And then at the end of the call, it'll save the whole chat from, from the time you came onto the call until the very end. But anyway, so let me hear from you, Paige, and from you, um, uh, Shawan. What did they do? What did they do that made the difference? Uh, I don't, so I just briefly, this is what I uh, got yesterday because I was concerned, uh, I guess Saturday, that that original election was a, a vote of one and it mm -hmm. was challenged by the Republican uh, loser. And it went up to the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, who said that the election needed to be reheld, uh, held again. So that was the election that was held yesterday because the mm -hmm. vote was so uh, close. I thought it was four at one time also, but they threw out or got some illegal votes and they couldn't make heads or tails. So they made them vote again. And this time, I want to say the percentage was 52 to 48 uh, percent. I can't tell you in particular what was done. I do know the group, uh, one of the groups that uh, work on the ground or support the effort was Black Voter Matters because we get these monthly updates about uh, efforts and activities. So someone put in the uh, chat, all streets, all people in Shreveport. So I guess I'm assuming it was just a collective effort of getting more voters to the polls. I'm looking up for you now if I can find the sheriff's race. I'll share with you those numbers while uh, Paige perhaps add in, unless Paige already knows yeah. the numbers. No, I don't have I don't have the numbers in front of me. But one of the things that I'll say is I think that, you know, there's no silver bullet to this work. And so and but what we want is for everything to align properly, right? And so like like I'll I'll make a comment here that was that was an observation that was made in some of the wins that we've recently had in Ohio is that like um you know having good organizing on the ground having a good network of organizations that are trusted messengers that work in communities all the time is is a necessary component to change and then when opportunities like this come like they're really able to capitalize on it. And and one of the things that I think uniquely about races like this, about the like the runoff with um, Reverend Warnock and Ossoff in, in 2020, different things like that is that these kinds of races break the myth that your vote doesn't matter, right? Now we're down to a couple of votes and you're like, oh, good, oh my goodness. Like, wow, my vote really does matter. So I'm gonna go and vote in this one because it matters, right? And at the same time, you have a whole bunch of people that you trust and that you know being like, you know what? Your vote matters, my vote matters, let's go do this thing, right? And so it all comes together. And instead of meeting with like resistance of like, no, it's not gonna make a difference. It's more like, yeah, you know what? We can do this. And I think that like, this is what we, this is the kind of condition that we try to create all the time, right? Like no matter what it is, we want that condition to be, yeah, we can do this. And there's a lot of barriers fighting against us being able to do that. But that's, I think, what we're what we're collectively working towards are moments when it's like we all feel compelled to do it for all of us. Well said, well said. Um, it is 
uh, 6.25, which is the time that we begin to wrap it up and take announcements, I want to make sure that, that I'm not overlooking any questions from, from anybody uh, before we begin to, to just have some closing remarks from our guest panelists. Valerie, anybody uh, have a, a question that uh, they feel they didn't get answered? Uh, that was the last one. I see Miss Laura. She just made some remarks that's in the in the comments. Uh, she just made some remarks. I think that she gave a suggestion that who we should contact. Um, but nevertheless, that's the last one. Thank you. Thank everyone Thank you. for their questions and their concern. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you, Valerie. Um, Shawan, would you just uh, uh, give us some closing remarks, uh, something that uh, uh, encourages us uh, and, and maybe a, a ask of all of us and, and leave us with a, a uplifting something that, that builds hope uh, in, in, as we look towards elections coming up in the future? All right, let, let's see if I can pull this one off. And it's probably, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the Cato numbers. I looked up and in October, it was 46,054 voters. And uh, Saturday's election, it was 65,000 voters. So that's a difference of almost 20,000 voters that decided that elections were important. So you go from that one vote to an increase of 20 voters. And again, that continues to be the hope that our efforts continue to yield that in spite of what we look at, you know, the hope is that uh, the hope is that we can uh, make a difference and elections are important. And we can look to what happened in Cato's sheriff election just to say the people, if we deliver the right message, if we get out there and, and, and engage with them, that they will show up and do what's best for their community. And with that, they were able to uh, make that one vote a difference between 53% and 50 and 47%, which is a big difference. Um, I'm hopeful that if you individually or your organization collectively would be interested in working with the Lower Ninth Ward Voters Coalition, we welcome you to come and help us do voter registration, to come and support the efforts of getting young people engaged, to make sure we provide those opportunities of what hope will look like and let them lead us in understanding a bill, being confident in that when we give them good information that they can make good decisions. Thank you, Shawan. Appreciate your wisdom and expertise and all the work that you're doing, and especially just being here tonight. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. We appreciate you. Yes, sir. Thank you all for inviting me. Paige, please uh, share with us your closing remarks. No, just thank you so much for for allowing me to be part of this discussion. Um, I think there's so much potential that we have here in Louisiana, so many obstacles, but like I really do have hope and want us all to bring hope to um, to engaging voters and and really making a change in Louisiana. I, I hope that we are heading towards the precipice of good things. Right yeah. Um, yeah. But it's been great talking with y'all. And I will also, the, the chat's been disabled, but I'll share my email out. Um, and, you know, if folks want to get in touch with me, it's page without an I, dot Gleason, G-L-E-A-S-O-N at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if you with with questions or as I try to work through like access to voter files and all that other kind of stuff, um, I'm here to just help all of us in this in this collective work. Thank you, Paige. Thank you for all you do. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, you've uh, helped to educate uh, all of us tonight. And uh, we we feel hopeful just by by hearing from you and uh, what you're doing and what you've worked on historically in the past and in so many different areas. So thank you so much for, for what you do. Uh, let me say this as we close, too. Um, you know, we can either look at this and and uh, and think that we have to each one of us conquer the world. But so much of it is just understanding that we've been given a corner of this earth and a certain number of people that we're in relationship with. If we could just begin to use our powerful voices and realize the power, the, the power of one, as it were, uh, that we can just speak one to another and have those conversations. If I can influence my brother or sister, my nieces or nephews, my grandchildren, uh, the people in my neighborhood, 
uh, let's just by the way and chip away at this issue one person at a time. And if we all are in agreement with doing that, we can make a difference. So let's start uh, uh, sounding the same, uh, making the uh, same sound with one voice that voter registration and voter turnout is extremely important. You talk to your neighbor, you talk to your people and do your, do your, make it your job. Uh, to tackle this issue where where you are in your corner of the earth, and and we will see a difference. So as we close tonight, uh, let's uh, have any announcements and anybody may have that uh, are of any events that we need to be aware of and uh, possibly participate in that are upcoming. Any any announcements at this time? I have an announcement if I could, and that is that um, that I I think Schwan needs to know this and and probably uh, Paige as well. But we often, before an election, we invite all the candidates to come and speak. And we speak, we we create questions that are over, you know, sort of umbrella questions. We ask a lot of, um, we do a lot of deep dive and amazingly they answer these things, which just floors me every time. But we ask a lot of tough questions and so, Shawan, I'm wondering if you, if we send you the announcements when we do this, that you could then turn around and send that out to your high school students. They just have to hook, you know, they just have to get on Zoom and they can listen and find out really what these candidates are about and how they, you know, and see them sort of in action talking about what their beliefs are. So that's that's my plug for Justice and Beyond because we do a lot of that during all election seasons. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, All Pastor, right. Uh, Pastor yes. Manning, I have no, an Wait a minute. Sharon was uh, we responding to Brooke. You on mute. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just say, Brooke, we try and uh, bring all of those candidates in front of the students directly that they organize and come up with questions. But if you send us something, uh, We'll be we'll try and fit that into something routinely that we do to make sure more access is provided to the students. All right, thank Thanks. you, Shawan. Thank you, Brooke, for that question. Um, Lane, you have an announcement? Yeah, um, I just want to uh, point out to everyone here who is still here um, that um, uh, the Grodet Youth Farm, which is uh, located on city in, in City Park, um, is really under attack by the City Park Conservancy. Uh, and um, I'm not going to go into all of the issues, but they're important issues for the community, for the young people in our community, in terms of, you know, educating them and giving them opportunities to, to learn about, about um, food and, and farming and, um, you know, environmentally sound, you know, programming. So please, if you would, if you want to find out more about it, I, again, the chat's been disabled, so I can't put my email in the uh, chat. But um, if you'll go to the to Instagram and on Facebook, there are now two new groups with all the relevant materials, and it's they're being added to um, uh, for friends of um, of Grodet, friends of Grodet. If it's just one one phrase, if you'll either search for that or go there. Um, we have um, a, a couple of meetings are coming up and we need your participation. Thanks. Thank you. So important, Lane. Thank you. So important. Uh, uh, thank you very much for making that announcement. Any other announcements? You got Betty. Betty had her finger up. Yes. And I just had to jump up because the timer went off. Um, Thursday night, there is a community meeting at Leah Chase School at 2727 South Carrollton about reopening Leah Chase, uh, reopening what used to be Lafayette School as a direct run school in Orleans Parish. It is not a charter. So anyone that lives in the area or might be interested in learning more about it, uh, join us Thursday evening at Leah Chase School in the cafeteria, 2727 South Carrollton. And what time, Betty? 6 p.m. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Betty. Uh, that is uh, our first direct run school after Katrina. It's uh, extremely important that we get engaged uh, so that we can begin to change the tide of what we've seen with the 
experimental charter school system that's been put in place in New Orleans. Any other announcements? All right, hearing none, uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer as we go our separate directions asking for God's protection. Oh God, uh, we, we know uh, that we all have a particular responsibility. And God, we help, uh, we, we ask that you would show us that each day. Show us how we can in ourselves make a difference. Reveal to us our power. Let us never forget uh, the power that is in each one of our voices. Let us never diminish ourselves or think that we, we, we're, we are not important or that our words don't matter. Every word that comes from our mouth matters and neither can subtract or add to uh, the, making this a better community. So help us realize that in and of ourselves. And so God, now as we go our separate directions, watch over us, let no hurt, harm, or danger come unto us until we come back safely into each other's presence again. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, in the name of Almighty God, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Be safe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.